Welcome to the Scale with Pros podcast with your host, myself, Cody Barton, the number one place to be if you want to build a business beyond yourself. And for all the resources we talk about in the show, make sure to head over to scalewithpros.com. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. So I have a really special guest today with me, Mr. Brandon Schwalm. And guys, this individual is actually somebody that I've known for years. And when I was first transitioning out of being a real estate agent and into being an investor, he was one of my first mentors. So it's really cool, you know, kind of coming full circle here and and being able to have him, you know, come on the podcast. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that you'll see on like social media, like doing, you know, posting about all the things that they're doing. And, you know, Brandon, someone that I think is literally the type of business that most people strive to create when they first get into business, but I'll let him share a little bit more about that. And so, so Brandon, if you want to just kind of take people through, okay, like how, how did you first get into business? You know, you have a real estate investing business now that's, you know, super successful, but you know, what was kind of the path, like getting into business and, you know, growing it to, you know, now four plus million a year in revenue? Yeah. Well, full circle now, the student has become the master. So that has been... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> something cool to see basically my story is i kind of started out how a lot of people did whereas one man show working crazy hours doing you know my main business is wholesaling and fix and flipping and you know for me the the beginning was doing everything myself doing all the acquisitions managing all the flips doing all that kind of fun stuff to now where between virtual assistants and Americans, I think we're right around like 30 people in our organization. So obviously it's grown a lot, but yeah, it's been, it's been a ride, lots of ups and downs, you know, it's not super easy, but, um, I even forgot the question you're asking, like, what else did you want me to go into? (laughs) Yeah. So, so I guess let's just look at that first phase, right? Like Mm -hmm. that zero to, you know, it's like working crazy hours, which, you Mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of people listening could understand like that is what it takes when you're first getting your business up and running. Right. So, but like then going up to that million a year in revenue and beyond point, like what were some of the key things that you did on that journey of zero to, you know, a million plus a year and, and revenue? Was it like certain key, was it hires that you made? Was it, you know, certain skills that you mastered that got you to that point? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, to like grow a business, it's always going to come down to the people and having the right people. You can learn all the skills you want and whatnot, but it only take you so far because you only have so much time to do everything yourself. So, I mean, for us, honestly, at, at least in like a, a real estate company, it doesn't take like a crazy amount of people to do a million a year. I mean, I think my first year where we did a, a million in revenue was like 2017. And it really was just like me, one acquisition manager and uh, one dispo manager. I mean, I had two acquisition managers. So, you know, it wasn't like a crazy big operation. You know, we, for for me, I always like to stay super lean, you know, and keep as much of the cash flow as possible. But Yeah. yeah, it's not like, at least in real estate, you don't need to have like a crazy organization to do a million a year. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And and for those that are listening, you know, when it's like that, the zero to one, and we're Brandon's Definitely. talking about acquisition dispo, as far as his team, for those that don't know the real estate, you know, wholesaling space, essentially, it's, you know, he had a salesperson helping get properties under contract to buy, and then he had a, you know, basically another s- salesperson that's selling those properties off to other investors or other flippers that, you know, wanted to buy those. And so, so really three, three man band to a million a year. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Four. I mean, and then you have like your virtual assistants and whatnot, you know, if you, if you count those, you probably have another, you know, maybe two or three people, but you know, those people, they don't, they're not super expensive. They're in different countries, probably costing, you know, five bucks an hour, six bucks an hour. So nothing yeah. too crazy in spend i mean i think like the f- for me like how i always looked at it was you know what am am i a not good at or b i don't like to do and then try to find those people in those seats first yeah yeah I, and i think it's a good lesson for for everyone because everyone listening has their own unique skill and has their own unique things that they do enjoy and love to do and you know like 
I know for, for me, it's like I never really enjoyed doing like the sales motions or like, you know, the mar sales and marketing in, in the business. Like that's never been super exciting or interesting to me. So I always try to find like hires that I could bring in to help do those things. Uh, and, you know, where I do like building teams and I like, you know, the operational side of business and, you know, leadership and, and things like that. But I think, you know, you you hit it, you know, right on the head there where I think a lot of people, they get. You know, I think from social media too, it's oh. like everyone sees people and like the loudest people always are what people see. So it's like people are like, you need to be closer. You need to be like this expert marketer. And it's like leaning into what you like and what you're good at and then hiring, you know, like you said, those people that can complement your skill sets and, you know, where they can, it's obviously all of the functions in business are important and need to be done, but just don't all need to be done by you. So then looking at, okay, from small team to getting to a million a year to now, you know, over four million a year, you're wholesaling, you're doing fix and flips, you're mm -hmm. you know, developing, you know, mm -hmm. spec new homes as well. What were some of the biggest challenges that, you know, you've now seen on that path from that to where you're at now? Like what are some of those new things that came up that, you know, weren't really as relevant in that, you know, smaller million or under stages? Yeah, I mean <laughs> I think it's constantly like for me, I'm always looking for like the A players, like who's producing the most and who are people that you can bring in that will make, you know, a significant jump in revenue and profit for you. I think when you're smaller, it's tougher because like you don't have like a proof of concept, you know, like my first hire of an acquisition, my first two hires were uh, one of my best friends at the time and then my brother-in-law. You know, because I had no proof of concept. Like, I'm like, I think if you guys do this right, you can make a hundred grand a year, but I didn't really know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Whereas like now it's a little bit easier for me to attract talent. Cause it's like my top sales guys, you know, two of, you know, I think my number one guy is on pace to do over 300 grand this year wow. and money in his pocket. And my like number two guys over 200. You know, so it's like I already have that proof of concept where I'm like, hey, you know, plug you in here. You, you can do this. It's already been done. You know, it's not just like theory. Yeah. And it's interesting because I talk to a lot of people that come on and we talk about, you know, for those that are past the, you know, multi, you know, doing a few million plus a year. It's that similar thing. It's like, okay, it's like so much hustle and just trying like brute force to get to a million a year. Mm -hmm. And then past that, then it's like organizing the team making sure right butts are in the right seats and then you know making sure that they're able to be as efficient as possible with you know the work that they're doing so it's interesting that being said it's you know getting those a players into your business mm -hmm. and i guess now going forward what do you see as like that next thing that you know you're working towards in in the business today my main focus now is getting this to where it's you know an eight figure company and you know, the problem we're having is just, I mean, there's only so many A players out there and trying to find, continuously find those people, you know, because like if I look at my top guy, if I can find six of those guys, I could do 10 million a year, right? But it's like finding those people, you know, so that's kind of part of the the hardest part of this you know is at least for us because you know like Alex Hermosi talks about is like figuring out what's your business behind the business which for my company is sales and marketing so mm -hmm. it's like finding out how do I just absolute do the best in sales and do the best in marketing you know yeah, and just and figuring that out so would you up. say then it's like getting the salespeople, like that's the bottleneck like getting more like a player salespeople, or it's other areas in the business too yeah i mean i'd say at the end of the day that's probably the biggest struggle and i think one of the things that i learned you know i just got back i mean you know this i just got back from uh alex Hermosi's workshop he was just talking to me about like how why are you not constantly interviewing people for sales? You know, because, you know, for us, we typically only are looking for new salespeople like two, maybe three times a year. And he's mm -hmm. like, what's the chances of you? You're looking for that right person at the exact same time that right person's looking for you. So it's like you should be constantly interviewing. And then when that A player comes up, you know, you just bring them on and figure it out later. 
Yeah. You know, and I think that was a mistake that I've made is I kind of slower to fire, you know, than I probably should be. I can't remember if I had told you about this, but we bought a, a residential cleaning company here in Arizona mm -hmm. and they were having this issue where they're like, yeah, we're, we're trying to, you know, we need to hire more cleaners and like we have this issue and they oh, yeah, like they, only were hiring when they needed a cleaner, not mm -hmm. consistently, you know, hiring. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. that was one of the things that we had them change. And like, just like you track your numbers on the, you know, marketing and sales side, like how many leads, how many of those leads, you know, turn into a contract of the contracts that come in, how many of those fall through and then how many of those actually closed cost yep. per contract, you know, the, you know, revenue per contract. And, you know, that's something that in any of the high, higher churn roles in a company, which sales is definitely one mm -hmm. of those, that's something that, you know, we're, we're always just keeping ads going. And so, you know, we'll just have the ads running. And then we also track the performance like per rep. So like with that cleaning business, which, you know, parallels to um, okay. with your business with sales, like one of the things that we're doing is like okay we have you know we keep the ads mm -hmm. running and we always have applications coming in and we're always having them do mm -hmm. you know do interviews so that if the right talent comes in we could bring them on and then we're also tracking as part of that uh Ooh. is the Ooh. churn of the cleaners so it's like which you could just be doing with the salespeople. obviously yeah. you know you know you could just see it's like what how long does the average rep stay is it seven months is it you know 14 months i know people stick with you longer typically from what i've seen but if you know what that time frame is then you could you know kind of match the marketing to scale up i guess for you too do you have like a minimum like revenue per rep per month that you like hold everyone to or is it you know it's more like per quarter because i mean you know how the real estate game is it, there's a lot of like i mean you can just have an an insanely good month and then you can have an insanely bad month so it's kind of i don't like to hold people per month but yeah i mean ideally we're looking at minimum like a quarter million a quarter yeah because that yeah because then you're looking at they're essentially making about forty two thousand forty three thousand a quarter you know so that should put them right around 150 a year which is kind of like what we're looking for like an average rep at least so then it's like with that then it's you know i guess it could just be every quarter it's like the reps that aren't achieving that part of continuously doing those interviews is testing new reps and trying uh -huh. to bring new ones in i think our culture is really good i i think you know, humbly, I think I'm a, a good leader for them. And, you know, I don't lead with fear. I'm real, you know, real lenient on what we allow. Um, so like when we get a good person, like they don't tend to leave, you know, I don't I think I've had like one sales guy actually quit. And that was my brother in law, who basically quit to go work for my dad. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so um, yeah, he was with me for six and a half years. So at that point, he was probably burnt out from yeah. doing sales, you know. But for the most part, you know, if we don't fire you, then you, they usually last at least a couple of years. And then I guess the question is, are your bottom, you know, one or two, are they hitting those numbers every quarter? Because then that oh, would... definitely not. Yeah, they're not. No, no. I mean, that was kind of part of my mistake is I just figured, you know, because we were spending. Last year, we were spending like 60000 a month in marketing, and we had three reps. This year, we've averaged, you know, we usually have like five or six reps at a time, and I've bumped it up to about one hundred and five to 110000 a month in marketing. And mm -hmm. we just, I mean, obviously, we've seen an increase in revenue, but the, the bottom line's going down because the bottoms aren't producing as well as, you know, the, the top three. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, to to Hormozzi's point is like you have to like whether it's salespeople or cleaners or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, name the business with like that higher, you know, more higher churn role where it's like you're having to bring in new people consistently okay. to make sure numbers are being hit. That's where, you know, I think you definitely see some benefit, you know, sad, sadly to say to whoever those reps are that are <laughs> bottom performers. But, you know, it's like we always say it's like skill or will. It's like they either got to They either got to have the work ethic to just get it done. Or it's like if the skill isn't there, it's like train up to it. And if they can't be coached up, then it's like they're going to have to be coached out and bring in a better 
better performing rep. I mean, it's it's funny because I like look at like my top guy. He's actually my cousin's husband. And I was at the point, this is like almost two years ago. I was at the point where I'm like, all right, I'm no longer hiring friends and family members. Because I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's just like, it makes it difficult when I have to have that difficult conversation to, you know, hey, you're, you're not doing what you need to do or yeah. know, letting them go. You know, my cousin basically like, begged me to give him a chance and mind you no sales experience he was a cop <laughs> for eight eight years oh my god and gosh. and i'm just like all right i'll give it a shot for you but if i have to fire him it's on you and they just came out the gate killing it and that's crazy it's the weirdest i mean i think i have an idea on why it's you know you know it just works hard and whatnot but it's just funny because he came in with absolutely no skill in that regard. But, you know, it's like they, I'll, if someone has the will, they can get the skill down. Because, like, if their mm-hmm. work ethic is is just freaking, you know, incredible, they can learn the script. They could practice objections I, every day. They could listen to sales call recordings. They could be role playing with other reps on the team. They could be asking mm-hmm. you or the other reps for feedback on their calls, on their appointments that they're you know, that they're having conversations with homeowners. And, you know, I'd take a bet on a person like that. And and especially like the sales department, if they're, you know, if they're hungry, like if they're kind of like, yeah, like I'll give it a shot. Maybe, maybe it'll work for me. It's like, yeah, maybe not. But the funny thing is like, sometimes it is hard with, with sales to know, you know, what that's going to look like. But I mean, that's what he told me he did at the beginning because, you know, our top guy Turner, he would just, he's like, all I did for like, the first couple months is like listen to Turner's calls, like how is he doing it and whatnot. I also think, you know, I didn't even put two and two together because I'm not that smart. But Hermosi's sales manager was, you know, he we were talking about the situation at the workshop, and he's like, he's like, well, you know, when you're hiring, you want to look for people that have done that job and done good at that job. You know, it's obviously ideal, yeah. but B. Or you want to talk to, you want to hire people that have spoken with those type of people before. It made me think, I'm like, okay, he was a cop for eight years. So he was kind of used to talking to, the, you know, our typical client. <laughs> Your ideal <laughs> ideal avatar of the yeah. crazy, crazy homeowners that are mm-hmm. doing crazy things. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Maybe that's, he knows how to talk to him already. That's super. Yeah. I mean, I imagine as a cop, you got to de-escalate, and I mean, some of those seller calls, like you're de-escalating for sure. You know, especially mm-hmm. if, you know going in for a price drop, like you know, yeah. it's gonna be a fun conversation. Yeah, that is interesting. That I mean, I guess it would translate. I mean, you're in a life uh, or death situation uh, as a cop, so uh-huh. talking to someone about you know having to get a lower price on their house probably isn't too too hard of a conversation anymore. So <laughs> no, no. I mean, his life is much different. He was working eighty hours a week as a cop. He said he was doing like 14, 12, 13 hour days, six days a week, and uh-huh. you know, and, and now making... he's doing yeah. He was making a hundred because he was a bunch yeah. of overtime, yeah. but. You know, now he's making three X that probably working 35 hours a week and working remote and remote. Yeah. So really, then, I mean, it sounds like for for your business, it's really and and for those that are listening, it's like on especially on the sales side, it's like if you have sales targets, then it's just holding the reps to those and not being scared to bring in new talent to, Mm -hmm. you know, see if they're able to perform better. And that's literally like that. Uh, I'll refrain from saying the company name because, you know, I don't want to scare any reps. But one of the companies that we have, there's a couple of the sales reps that are just not performing great and kind of having some attitude uh, challenges. And so like with that company in particular, they're they're doing good on like their numbers, but like they're, you know, having some other issues like core value wise and, you know, just not being fully compliant and, you know, the CRM, which, you know, who knows, salespeople just, you know, that's. That's a consistent thing, but but it's like, what do you? If they're producing well, I mean, you know, you know, ideally, hopefully, just fix that problem instead of letting them go and hoping that the next person can produce as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And and we're actually 
like with that particular business, we're changing the model a little bit from having the reps, you know, working their leads directly to going more of like a setter closer or SDR type route in, in order to attempt to fix some of the CRM things. Cause it's like, all right, we're going to have the, you know, our, our SDR work, the CRM work, the lead, tee it up for the closer. If the closer doesn't close it, then the setter or SDR goes back in and then brings the lead and starts nurturing it again to make sure that we're getting everything that we need done in the CRM. And so that's, uh, that's something that we're, we're going to be testing in particular with that, with that company. Um, do you guys, you guys use lead managers or the reps just get their own leads and just work them? Depends on the lead for any of our like super expensive cost per leads. It goes direct to, um, you know, the The, acquisition manager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like some of our, like, you know, our cold calling leads and stuff like that, like those are more teed up a bit by, yeah. You know, and then we have a lead manager that, you know, his whole job is basically trying to find old leads that slipped through the crack and, you know, try to revive them. Nice. No, that, that makes sense. So, so I guess then, you know, from, uh, I'm just curious, what was your biggest takeaway from that Hormozy workshop? Obviously there's a lot of people that have said good things about it. I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, I, I it was like 80% coaches and agencies there. And so like, if that's your, your field, I mean, just so many gold nuggets, you know, just a lot of good information, a lot of stuff that like you could try to apply to your business, but you know, on my business, but it just doesn't really translate. It was just like one, you know, I should be lis- listening to more of their sales calls. You know, mm-hmm. I don't do any of that. Yeah. So that was a big thing that I took away. I was like, he's like, you should be listening to three calls per week per rep, you know, and then seeing what they did well and what they need to improve on. And that's as so, the sales manager role or like you're, he's just saying use the owner sales manager. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sales manager. But, so it's like a mixture between me and the, you know, our COO. Got but, it. Okay. You know, so that was kind of a big one. And then yeah, constantly just be looking for sales reps. You know, those were the, the two things is like, you know, if you're not folk, if you've been working this whole time and your business isn't growing substantially, you're working on the wrong things, you know? And I think that really resonated with me because I do work a lot and my business isn't exploding. It's, it's not doing bad, but it's not doing, you know, 50% not going to the next increase. Level. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it's not doing 50, a hundred percent increase year over year. No, that makes sense. What do, what do you what do you consider is like the the goal like yearly on a like what do you consider is good on a percentage increase year over year? So every year since I started, we increased at least twenty percent a year. This may be the first year that we don't get a twenty percent increase. We'll see if it hits. You know we're pretty close to on pace to that, but quarter four always tends to be close, uh, what's it called? Quieter in our industry. So we'll yeah. see, but yeah, I mean, I ideally at least like 30%, you know, yeah. my, our biggest jump, once we've been in the millions, our biggest jump was like a 45% jump year over year. And, and honestly, I mean like the, like in the private equity space where like the smartest people in the world oh. are going in and taking over companies, it's like mm-hmm. they're. You know, like the big PE companies, they're mm-hmm. they're looking for and striving for like thirty percent year over year, and so sometimes I think it's like I know I'm always looking at and like how do we double every year like everything, yeah. and it's like that's just not always realistic, and you know especially yeah, as you get I tried to double <laughs> double marketing, didn't work. If you, if I just spend exactly double what I'm spending right now, it should yeah. perfectly convert into that. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> That's always the the frustrating thing about marketing is it's like it's such a fickle thing where it's like I don't know. We've well, always found this and I'm curious to see if you see the same thing. It's like you can never really double that and like and it just expect it to work. There's like this weird diminishing return that just happens for some reason, but like what we always look at okay, try to increase just like you know like paid ads online, you know with mm-hmm. like our com- company plant guy like 
we're just like, okay, if we can increase, like, you know, every two weeks, 10 to 15% in our ad spend, like, and then still be within like the, you know, reasonable return on ad spend, like we're, we're happy, but it can be frustrating when you look at it and you're like, dang, like I'm getting like five or seven or 10 X on my money and you just want to like go faster and then it mm-hmm. freaking tanks and then you have to like rebuild up again. And it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you've had experiences with doing that. <laughs> well, I just feel like, especially if it's in like the ex- exact same marketing channel, it's almost like if you increase it, like your audience is getting a little bit colder as you like increase it. Like it's not as like, you know, like in our field, right? You have like those super motivated leads, but there's only so many of those. Yeah. You know, so like in, in, I'm sure there's people out there like me that are spending a ton of money to target them. So like you have to start going out and farther out and less motivation and, you know, so it makes it a bit more difficult for sure. So what's, what's the end goal for the, for the real estate business? I always like asking people like what they're going to do. Like I had this guy on, you know, for context last, last week, he had a construction company and he's doing like 5 million a year. And he's like, dude, I'm taking home great money. I don't have to work that much. I kind of have like this team going and I'm just doing, buying rentals and doing stuff with my family. And I'm like, it was super interesting because like, you know, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people talk about like, oh, I want to build this like hundred million dollar thing. And I'm like, I don't even think I want to do that necessarily. I, I just want businesses that grow and don't fully rely on me. And that can be, you know, spit off millions in profit, but not have to be a slave, you know, to those businesses. And it's interesting as like goals change over time on like a lot of the vanity stuff of like build it to a hundred million or a billion dollar thing. And so just curious mm-hmm. on what your thoughts are on that with, uh, with the company. My goal has kind of always been get to the 10 million a year mark, you know, while I'm working in it less than I'm working in it now. And then Mm -hmm. hopefully have it run kind of by itself. And then I can focus on like bigger assets, you know, storage facilities, small multifamilies, whatever it is, the the next chapter is. It's like, I'm not going to stop working. I don't know what I would do. You know, you can only go to so many beaches of the world and, you know, drink there until it's like, all right, what's next? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you guys, know? this is coming from someone that travels, I don't know, multiple months of the year, every year for the last 10 years, eight years. Well, not as much now that I have a kid, <laughs> but before for sure. Having yeah, a kid, but- now you're only going like, you know, two months a year. <laughs> only for people listening and they're like dude i go on like one trip a year right now <laughs> yeah yeah no, i mean i tell people i'm like honestly it's like the ideal business to build is similar to like what my friend brandon's built and it's like you know where you had been doing that obviously pre-kids so i guess mm-hmm. the lesson is guys don't have kids if you want freedom i guess is that the, is that the... <laughs> or you make a lot of money and then you just bring the nanny with you everywhere yeah so that's so the other option do so so that's that's the other option that you have but that was always something that like when I was still you know entering in on the real estate investing side and you know I saw how Brandon's business would run it's like he had you know all of this stuff working and was able to travel and had all this freedom and flexibility and you know and great you know it was making you know phenomenal money in it too and so I always like asking that because I think everyone has a different goal and there's people listening that might be like I want to build a hundred million dollar company or build a company that I exit for like 20 million dollars and then there are some people that it's like yo like if I could just build this lifestyle and I think I'm you know growing more into that of like I just want the certain lifestyle and to like work on like projects that are fun and exciting and like challenging and like learning new things with good people and you know, where it's like you can have good peace in your life, but also like challenge, you know, and not really caring as much about like the actual like vanity metric of like top line revenue or whatever, you know? I mean, what kind of better lifestyle do you need? You've got a Lambo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want to I want to collect more cars, like, you know, so like I obviously I I live a good good lifestyle as well. And you know, I don't know about you, and, and this is, you know, probably my conservative part of my personality, but as I've been getting older, you know, turned 30 in May this year, I've started to become a little bit more conservative where I'm like, I do want to, you know, dare I say, I do want to pay off my house, you know, within a couple of years or a few years and just not have, like, I just don't want to have any payments on my personal stuff anymore. I'm just kind of like, I just want to 
not have any payments and you know not have to really worry about any of that. I don't know if that's if you feel that at all. If you're like you fucking weird Dave Ramsey guy. Mm, not really. No, I'm a little. I'm a lot more riskier than you are. Well, yeah, yeah. You're, you're like the guy that's like, hey, put put this money in this weird forex trading <laughs> scam thing that I hope hope isn't a scam, but other people maybe are making money with it. Let's put like a hundred grand in and see how it goes. <laughs> Didn't go great for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, only one of them's got a hit, and then it pays for all my losses. <laughs> so the lesson, everybody that's listening, is. You know, I guess on your personality, like I have very conservative, I like sure things and sure bets on, you know, the, the, <laughs> the investments that I do. And then, you know, you have Brandon, that's like, you know, all in hold, hold on the Bitcoin and, you know, metaverse and Forex <laughs> trading bots and all, all that. <laughs> Bought three Amazon stores for 30K a pop, lost money on all of them. It's been great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a ride. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, so, I get it. I just like, for me, it's like, like your house. I think it depends on like what kind of interest payment you have on it. You know, like I look at like my Porsche, it's like my payments, whatever, I think like 1400 a month, but I pay 4000 a month on it because my interest payment's like 7% because rates are horrible. If that was like a 3% loan, I'm probably just going to pay minimum and let it ride out because I'm like, I'll easily it down. make more than yeah. I'll easily make more than three. Per, I mean, three percent is basically free money. Yeah, but you know, yeah. if you've got like a higher interest rate, then yeah, I would be trying to pay that down as fast as I can. Totally makes sense on that. I think that's where you know I feel that on my house right now, just like uh, like having a high interest rate, and I'm just like, right. this is annoying. Like I just wish I bought like it on two that? years ago. Six point eight seven five. <laughs> yeah, it's a little high. Yeah, yeah. So that I wish was a little, <clears throat> little lower. But you know, hopefully. I mean, it seems like the whole economy is going to crap right now. So you know, hopefully that'll bring rates down. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. I mean, shit in Florida, you can't give away houses. It's it's horrible there. So are you seeing that now? You know, as far as I guess in Florida is where you do business, but you live in Texas. Yeah. But what changes have you seen in the market this year? Just for for those that maybe aren't yeah. in the real estate what industry and they're like, this is a lot of this is you know just yeah. not uh, not topics that they really are listening to as much. Like what are what are you seeing on just economic changes? Obviously, as someone that sells investment properties yeah. to other investors, I do take down. You know, I think right now I have like 26 properties myself. The main thing I'm noticing is just like stuff. I mean, in order to sell anything, you have to basically undercut the rest of the market. You know, like we we built a, a brand new house in College Park, Florida. So like a really nice area of Orlando. And when we were building it, the what we thought it would be worth based on what other stuff we're selling for was like 1.3. Mm -hmm. We listed ours at 1.2. Now we're down to a million and it's still not selling, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff that we're doing fine with is like our cheap mobile homes, you know, anything under yeah. medium price and below. What do you, you won't even, you won't even lend me on the, the brand new mobile homes. So don't even talk like that. <laughs> Dude, the, 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 the affordable product though, like that stuff's moving. That's why. I, <clears throat> I just never had the risk tolerance for flipping any luxury stuff. Like even like the years that I was flipping, like the most expensive flip that I ever sold, like after like after the fix up, I think was mm -hmm. maybe seven hundred. Yeah, I don't like, I don't love it, but it's like like the new build, for example. I bought the land for a hundred and seventy grand. We built the house for four thirty. You know, so, so you're it's under like, for what six hundred. Yeah, that, so call oh, it yeah. seven hundred after all holding cost and whatever mm -hmm. fees. So it's like even if it sells for a million, it's still probably three hundred k, you know, yeah. in our pocket. Yeah, you which know? is so it's, phenomenal. That's the the great thing about those price points is like if you can build at a cheap price, you know. But then still, it's like we're at, we're selling a freaking mobile home in Orlando for like four hundred grand. Yeah, brand yeah, new that's... mobile. You know, yeah, that that oh. product and, and out here, you know, the in Arizona, there's that's the stuff that's moving like, mm -hmm. you know, any anything that's above the median right now, it's like stuff sitting for like our inventory in days on market has just been 
you know, consistently pa- stacking up. <clears throat> and it's mm-hmm. significantly just all of that above above the median stuff. It's, you know, any luxury stuff here is just like, I mean, 60, 90, 100 plus days and in the of and the above like million million five plus type you know price points anyways well like the the five worst markets in the country are all in florida for a year over year inventory increase so really? like like cape coral florida like southwest florida we don't even market to there anymore just because like the year over year inventory is like 139 percent. we had a deal there we were talking to the guy he bought it in december of 2023 for a million dollars it was listed for 1.1 he bought it for like 985 then two weeks later his wife dies and it was his wife's dream to have that house on the water in florida so he's like well screw it i want to sell it he lists it again for 985 drops it all the way down to 700k right now can't sell it and then he came to us was like hey would you buy it for 500 and i still want to buy it for 500 Wow. Uh-huh. So yeah, that's, blood in the water. Yeah, that's uh, that's for sure. How how's Point Siena, uh, Florida doing? <laughs> I have well, one random rental there. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. <laughs> Perfect. Is it Airbnb? <laughs> no, it was just a long term rental that someone sold us when I needed a, a tax write off on like December twenty seventh, like a couple years ago. Uh, I would have sold you one. <laughs> You're my ideal client, someone just looking for a write-off, not even looking to make money. <laughs> We're actually in, in a lot of our other like investor buddies here locally anyways are, you know, actually selling a lot of the rentals and we're we're gonna start selling probably 10 to 15 of ours over the next like year and a half like as stuff goes vacant i don't know if you've seen this with your rentals with the way the markets change but like our rent rates Definitely have went steep. down on a lot of stuff and our just the capital yeah. expenses on stuff is just it seems it's just been like beating the crap out of us the last like year and a half and so i'm looking at all this debt equity sitting and stuff i'd rather put that money into some other stuff right now i don't know if you're are you seeing the same thing a lot of our friends here are well i'm like the the lazy landlord that doesn't raise rent because he doesn't he's too lazy doesn't want to don't want to kick him out don't want to kick him out don't want to deal with it but yeah i definitely i mean especially like in florida because insurances have gone up so high with the hurricanes so, yeah, it's definitely diminished the returns on it. Do you do any Airbnbs out there or all long-term? Yeah, we have an Airbnb in Sarasota, Florida. Is that doing pretty good? No. <laughs> I mean, what's good? I mean, it makes like a 1000 bucks a month, but it's like, you know, we bought that one sub two, and we took over like a 2.5% interest rate. So, you know, we've got a ton of equity in it, and... It does decent, but it's still, you know, pain to to manage for a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. So for those people listening in that are like, that sounds Dollar. great, you know, <laughs> don't feel bad for Brandon. Well, I mean, it doesn't sound bad, I guess, but like it's a lot to manage for a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. Do you self-manage it? Well, Kim does. Oh, well, then so. you, you aren't doing it. So that's great. <laughs> that works. But I just yeah. hear the problems like. Oh, there was all this blood in a bed. Oh, someone pooped here, and it's like, what the <laughs> hell? Like people are, people are weird, man. <laughs> yeah, managing yeah. Airbnbs that that was one of the things, and you know, I I just like like I've always been like I just want to build businesses, and then yeah. any of my investments, I don't want to manage any of it. I just I I just want other people to manage that stuff because exactly that. I I self managed our rentals the first couple years, and I wanted to like just pull my hair out. All the time because people are yeah. freaking stupid. What would you, uh, I guess two things. One, on the journey to a multi-million dollar business, is there any any book recommendations that you would tell people that they should read on, you know, on that journey um, that was like a big impact for you? I read so many books from when I was like 18 to 25 that I kind of don't even read that many books anymore. <laughs> so I'm like, but I, I think anything around like mindset you know, I think that's really the difference. You know, it's like, you'll be able to learn all the skills and how to operate and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, like, if you haven't built a strong enough mind, then it doesn't really matter. You know, and those are all like, outwetting the devil, think and grow rich, all the, you know, generic basics, like the fundamentals. For me, I really like like spiritual books, like power of now, you know, 
those kind of stuff. Man search for meaning, you know, just the the classics. The last question would be, what would you go back and tell yourself when you're first starting like the journey and building this business, you know, uh, to help you go faster? What would be the tip you'd give your starting self to grow your business faster? Well, I'd say first buy Bitcoin. Didn't have to worry about much. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing really else would have mattered. Um, and then if I had to start all over, I mean, for for my business, it would be, yeah, just constantly hiring sales reps, you know, just find like, find what it is. Like, I never really thought about the fact of like, what's my business behind the business? And like, every business is different. And like, just like really focusing on what it is that is your business like cleaning's probably what just doing the best cleaners it's cleaners it's marketing and sales isn't hard for a cleaning business people's houses are dirty they want to Uh get them cleaned and they will pay you to do it but the key is are you going to do it well enough to then have them have you keep coming back that's literally the model of the business is having good quality cleaners is the key yeah well and it's like having a, a like a software business you don't need like it's a product business. It's if you have a great product, doesn't matter how good in sales and marketing you're going to do because the product sells itself. Whereas like if you have a really good market sales and marketing, but you have a shitty product, you're just going to have some churn. Yeah. You know, so it's like just figuring out what's the business behind your business and then just like focus, focusing 80% of your time on that. Awesome. Well, Brandon, where where can people find you if they want to? I don't know. Maybe there's some people in the real estate business that would you know love to buy deals from you, or sure. they want to follow your your journeys around the world of your very sad two months of the year traveling. Where where can uh, people find you? For Instagram, it's Brandon B R A N D Y N dot E T H. For if you want to email me, my email is just Brandon B R A B R A N D Y N at I buy fl.com and that's buy is like you buy something not the other way we'll make sure it gets in the show notes too for everyone so but uh appreciate you coming on brandon you know it's a uh, the goal on on here is you know bringing on real operators not you know just people that are influencers and just like have a business that's just social media facade it's you know that's you know so i appreciate you coming on and, yeah, a lot, there's plenty of those. And, you know, the goal <laughs> on this show is bringing people that have actually built real businesses and solved real business problems to help others, you know, you know, make that jump from six to seven plus figures a year in business. So appreciate you being here. Of course, brother. Appreciate it.